So good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you again. Um, and sorry about the trying to coordinate microphones and whatnot. Um, so as, as Mark mentioned, our other keynote speaker, um, Carlos Preto, is, is, is on his way. <laughs> and we'll be here later in the day, but we still have the privilege of, of hearing from Julia Swig who is the Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies and a Director for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She also directs the Council on Foreign Relations Global Brazil Initiative and Cuba in the 21st Century Program. And I know she just gave a wonderful talk on Brazil on campus yesterday, so she's been a tremendous asset to our campus community this week. Um, she's the author of Cuba, What Everyone Needs to Know, which is on sale in the lobby if anyone is interested in purchasing it, published by Oxford University Press in 2009. And also the book Friendly Fire, Losing Friends and Making Enemies in the Anti-American Century, as well as numerous publications on Latin America and American foreign policy. Um, Swag's Inside the Cuban Revolution, Fidel Castro and the Urban Underground, which was published by Harvard University Press, received the American Historical Association's Herbert Feist Award for Best Book of the Year by an independent scholar. She serves on the International Advisory Board of the Brazilian Center for International Relations and on the Editorial Board of Foreign Affairs in Latino America. She was the sole Lenowitz Professor of International Relations at Hamilton College in 2011 and from 1999 to 2008 served as consultant on Latin American Affairs for the Aspen Institute's Congressional Program. She holds a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Cruz. So she's another fellow UC grad and an MA and PhD from the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies. And it is our tremendous pleasure to have her here with us this morning. Thank you, Lisa. And um, thank you for the invitation and for um, having me come out to California. I always come to California, which as Lisa mentioned, is the place where I not only went to college down the street at UC Santa Cruz, um, but went to high school here as well. And uh, the, the theme of California and Cuba resonates greatly because it was um, as a student at UCSC in the early 1980s that a very important person who's here today, Saul Landau, uh, grabbed a group of us in a seminar that he was teaching called Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Latin America um, and, and arranged somehow to send perhaps one of the first, I mean I know in the, of course, the 60s and 70s there were droves of uh, students in different um, iterations going to Cuba, but in 1984, that was my first taste of the island um, and the beginning of an education, thanks to Saul, um, who's here today. And um, I, I know I'll be fact-checked by Saul, by Karen Wald, and by Nelson Valdez, and Wayne Smith. So I feel like I'm um, you know, on notice, lest I uh, make a mistake, which I'm sure I will. Just don't be too specific. Exactly. <laughs> no data points because exactly. the, 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 the geniuses are in the audience. Um, I, I thought what I would do today, so, so the California residence is, is, is truly wonderful to be here and um, I thought what I would do today, um, you'll hear from um, Carlos this afternoon, is uh, cover three dimensions of how I generally think um, about what's happening today in Cuba. Um, in a way, sort of with a geographic shorthand, uh, what's happening in Cuba? I'll speak about um, the developments um, in recent years. What's happening in the diaspora among Cuban Americans, uh, not just in Florida, but generally? And there, I'm sure I'll make another mistake. Um, and, and of course, US policy. Uh, Congresswoman Lee uh, gave you, and thanks to the conference organizers for having women kick off your conference as well. Um, you know, to, to, to talk about what's happening on the ground, and it's remarkable, I've been traveling back and forth to Cuba for now a quarter of a century, half the life of the Cuban Revolution. Um, so I, I understand that most talks are supposed to start with a joke and make you laugh to warm up, but um, I don't remember punchlines of jokes well, so I don't want to do that, but what I w do want to do is tell you a little bit of an anecdote, um, which is uh, two years ago, I had the opportunity to spend the good part of a week off and on with and around Fidel Castro. And uh, that came about because a journalist by the name of Jeffrey Goldberg, who writes for the Atlantic Magazine, uh, at the end of the summer, August 2010, not long after Fidel himself had come out 
for one of his first public addresses since recovering from his illness, came and spoke for about six minutes, which was long for him, um, came out and spoke about his worry about the pending crisis in the Middle East and a potential nuclear conflict that President Barack Obama might be risking. Of course, Fidel understood the risks of being a young president and entering into nuclear politics, and he had something to say about the Middle East. And not long after that, Goldberg came out with a piece on the cover of the Atlantic magazine that said something like, I'm worried too about the pending nuclear conflict in, in the Middle East. And um, Fidel, who reads voraciously still, called his ambassador in Washington and said, get me Goldberg. I want to talk to this man. And uh, Ambassador Bolaños called me, and I don't know if it's why he called me, I, I, Jewish geography or something, but <laughs> he, he said, Julia, can, can you find Goldberg? <laughs> and in fact, I could. And within a couple of days, the two of us were sitting in the Miami terminal with the pink plastic wrapped suitcases that all of you know. Um, getting ready to board a flight to Havana where um, we were picked up and rushed off. And then that afternoon, I think, uh, or maybe the next day, we uh, went to the Palacio de Convenciones where Fidel has an office that he sometimes uses now and spent several hours followed by a lunch with Fidel talking about the Middle East, talking about um, uh, Fidel's sense of his own experience in Cuba growing up um, around the idea of uh, Israel, anti-Semitism. He was clearly sending some messages that he hoped that Jeff Goldberg would disseminate internationally. But at our lunch, w after the main interview, I tried to get Fidel to talk about Latin America. This is a long anecdote, but I'll get to the punchline in a second. And I asked him, well, you know, what do you make of what's going on in the region? Enough with the Middle East. Tell me about your own neck of the woods. And I wanted him to talk about Evo Morales and Chavez and Lula and, you know, his progeny, if you will, in Latin America. Uh, but he didn't really answer the question. So Goldberg, the journalist who just got more directly to the point, said, so, you still going to be uh, exporting revolution in Latin America? The revolution, the Cuba, are you still exporting the Cuban model? And Fidel said, and this was the sort of quote that rang around the world, the Cuban model, it doesn't even work for us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, Goldberg and I looked at each other like, did he really just say that? And that, of course, you know, to Cubans in Cuba and to all of you who study Cuba closely, that was not news. But to the foreign press and to the, uh, those of us that aren't immersed in Cuba, it was pretty stunning to have Fidel acknowledge what was not just an open secret, but sort of the daily currency of political life in Cuba today, which is how do we take what we've got, keep the good stuff, get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, and move on. And, what is the legacy of the revolution for the second and third and fourth generations that are coming down the road? And that was to, that, that statement by Fidel preceded what was then the rollout by Raul Castro of a number of measures that had been <coughs> test driven in certain pockets geographically in Cuba and um, debated with the idea of building a consensus among the party within the the broader population beyond the party. And where we are now uh, on the island, and, and Congresswoman Lee alluded to this, we're six years since, just a bit over six years since Fidel stepped down and gave provisional power to Raul. Raul is now in his fourth year of, no, fifth year, it'll conclude in the beginning of 2013, fifth year of his first term as president of the country, um, nominated by the Council of State, elected by the National Assembly, and he is in his first term of what might be only two terms as Secretary General of the Communist Party. So ha we have a, a process which you could call updating the model, you could call it a reform process, 
you can call it transition, transis, like, excuse me, transition, succession. Um, but to put in context what, what I see as really the weaving together of a new social contract in Cuba, I'll acknowledge first what hasn't happened. And this kind of responds to the way uh, the, the reporting from the major media covers Cuba. What hasn't happened in Cuba? Um, and that maybe the bureaucrats and politicians in US government agencies are looking for. What hasn't happened? We haven't had Jimmy Carter run down there and monitor an OAS-sponsored multi-party election. That hasn't happened. The IMF and World Bank haven't sent groups down there to do a major structural adjustment package, although <laughs> Cubans themselves would tell you that they feel as if that is happening, maybe a little bit in slow motion, but certainly in terms of the reduction of the size of the state and the reduction of um, the subsidies the state granted to all aspects of Cuban lives. Um, it might as well be, perhaps, although maybe in more slow motion. We haven't seen in Cuba massive privatizations. You haven't seen major sell-offs of the strategic um, economic resources of the country, nor have we seen, yes, major inflows of foreign investment from abroad. And we haven't seen in Cuba, and this is part of, um, part of the fantasy, if you will, that you see if you take the time to read the this thick, long transition documents that the US government has produced about what a transition should look like. We haven't seen the emergence of a Lech Walesa or a Vicente Fox, for that matter, or a Václav Havel. That is to say, the other major question that we hear answered so much is, well, who's, gonna, who's coming up behind the ranks? When, when Raul goes, who's coming next? And um, isn't dissident X or dissident Y the next one? Well, we haven't seen that either. But what we have seen, and again, it depends on how you think of time and history, are the four or five years that have transpired since Raul took office uh, a period of slow and excruciating change? Or are they a period of rather remarkable progress given the political culture and the uh, public expectations of the state that he inherited? Um, we've seen uh, liberalizations in terms of the expansion of uh, agricultural markets, um, a land reform, the opening up of the buying and selling of agricultural products. We've seen uh, privatization of <clears throat> property in terms of the titling to real estate um, holdings for uh, individual Cubans and the ability to buy and sell real estate legally. We've seen the beginnings of a creation of a small business culture, albeit the access to credit, the access to a wholesale market, just the sheer uh, know-how of how to run a business, the skill set that requires is slow in coming. We've seen the, the privatization of some services and the legalization of a whole swath of what was for a very long time um, economic activity that took place only in the black market. We've seen Fidel's cabinet almost entirely replaced. We've seen the uh, cap on wages lifted. We've seen the beginning of currency reform, that is the, uh, the, the, the beginnings of a process of addressing the dual currency that is so wacky and such a symbol of and creator of inequality in Cuba. We've seen the expansion of access to cell phones. We've seen the elimination of almost half a million uh, state jobs, um, creation of cooperatives. And we've heard that by 2014, this from the economic czar of the country, that close to 45% of the Cuban economy will be in private hands. Two, two, that's in two years. So go back to 2008, and you say, wow, what's Raul planning to accomplish in this amount of time? It's, it, it's quite a very, very tall agenda. And when you listen to Raul Castro, sometimes he sounds more like Margaret Thatcher than Karl Marx. When he talks about uh, efficiency and productivity and the accumulation of capital, not as an evil, but as a social necessity to reinvent and uh, rebuild a social contract in Cuba.
This is all not just in the category of economic reform. Of course, there are major political implications to the kinds of changes we're talking about, to reinventing the expectations of, uh, the, that Cubans have of what the state is going to deliver. And there, I think it's a kind of ambivalence where Cubans want the state to get out of the way, but they also very much have internalized the notion that the state is there to provide certain, the certain, a certain floor, a certain basic level of social services for the most vulnerable, if not for everybody. We've also seen um, the um, much more frontal addressing by the Cuban state, the Cuban government, of corruption. And I think that the, um, this um, effort to remove individuals who are corrupt is not only about economics, it's not only about needing to prepare the way for some level of foreign investment, but it's also, of course, deeply political because the stakeholders in the, pre the status quo ante um, are many, and the kinds of, um, I mean, you could call it a mixed economy, but allowing multiple forms of production, private, cooperative, public, also implies um, that the rule of law become a lot more the name of the game rather than the kind of petty and large-scale thievery and corruption that the previous system engendered. So that process has been real and serious. And another one I think that is um, remarkable, and I'll, I'll direct you to something that just was published yesterday on the website of UNEAC, is the way public debates are taking place in Cuba. Public government-sponsored media, Gran Mahub and Tudor Rebelde, you know, the ones that have been around forever, they, they're still state organs, but they're beginning to provide, beginning to provide some level of, um, uh, play a role of exacting accountability from the government and from public officials. But outside of those institutions, we see in the Cuban blogosphere and among um, leading figures and just, you know, plain Janes and Joes, a level of openness and debate that is more open and more free than at least in my 25 years I've ever seen before. And I would, uh, to get a sense of how difficult transforming a country's political culture is, I would direct you to an essay that one of the individuals who did not get his uh, visa, Rafael Hernandez, published yesterday on the website of UNEAC, which is a very, very deep discussion about the, what he calls the dark side of Cuban political culture. And it's, a, and it's a brave and important analysis of how difficult this transformation um, of how Cubans do politics on the island really is. And what's notable, um, and now I'm going to move to the United States and leave, leave Cuba, what's notable also is that although the embargo and U.S. policy is very present in today's Cuba, of course, and plays a role in many different ways. Um, what's refreshing is how introspective this Cuban debate among Cubans has become. Yes, the embargo strengthens hardliners. Yes, it is an economic impediment, to say the least. But Cubans are talking to one another about <coughs> About, about themselves without just chucking responsibility for the downside or upside of, their, of what they've created onto Washington. And that's extremely, extremely impressive. And it's another reason why it's so profoundly stupid and sad that we don't have Rafael Hernandez here uh, to speak for himself. So let me um, jump up and leave Cuba and come to the second um, point of geography. And if I, I'm extending my comments a little bit, but. You're at about 17 minutes. I'm at 17 minutes now? Yeah. <laughs> Give or take. Um, <laughs> I'll leave time for questions, though. So, um, so the United States, you think about the brackets of the Trinidad Tobago Conference in April 2009 that uh, Congresswoman Lee mentioned. And the other side of that, the Cartagena Summit of the Americas in April of 2012 in Colombia. Barack Obama showed up in Trinidad, Tobago, as Congresswoman Lee mentioned, ready to, well, let's say, with a, an audience of Latin American and Caribbean heads of state who were ready to give him the benefit of the doubt. 
And he was coming off of a period, of course, of two terms of George Bush in which public opinion internationally of the United States had really plummeted. And the mere fact that we could elect Barack Obama really just gave us as a country a huge boost. And so you had heads of state in Lat from Latin America coming to Trinidad and Tobago ready to give this new president the benefit of the doubt. And he came and before, you know, there are perhaps arguably 18 more important strategic issues in the hemisphere in Latin America for the United States than Cuba. Cuba is very important in many ways, but it's not the only issue on the table. And nevertheless, heads of state under Bush and then leading up to the Congress, um, to the, the conference in, in, in Trinidad had made a very clear message sent to the White House, you all need to deal with Cuba. It's important to us symbolically, substantively. These are left, center, left governments in many cases in Latin America who have publics that care about Cuba for all of the historic reasons. And so Obama showed up in Trinidad, Tobago, having just announced a teeny, teeny, tiny package of measures related not to sort of broadly uh, re writing a new chapter on Cuba policy that he had promised, but liberalizing travel and remittances for Cuban Americans and not much else. And um, fast forward, Trinidad, Tobago, four years later, Cartagena, and we have a United States that is inc that has lost that benefit of the doubt again when it comes to having failed to really move the ball forward on Cuba. I think the president was blindsided and very poorly staffed when he showed up in Cartagena and heard a unanimous, and now we're not talking just center-left government, so we're talking Santos of Colombia, Calderon of Mexico, and Piñera of Chile, and he hears a uniform message, which is, we've got to get the, the drug policy on the table. It's a significant problem. Let's talk about it. Roll up your sleeves, Mr. President. But what was the other major message? The other major message was Cuba. And there won't be another summit of the Americas until Cuba is present. That, that you know, to, to say that Cuba has again overshadowed uh, American, America, Washington's Latin America policy is, is to repeat only the same story that we've had for the last 50 years. And there has been, sadly, a the reasons for that are, of course, domestic. You know, we have the Cuban Five in Congress, um, the Cuban American delegation <laughs> that is, thank you for giggling at that. Um, we appreciate it. That, that, of course, has the capacity to throw sand in the, in the gears and slow down what minimal political will did exist in 2009, but we also have an administration for which Latin America really matters almost not at all, that has been focused primarily on the domestic agenda of the economy, of job creation, of, uh, of the recession, and obviously now in re-election, but internationally is, I mean, you know, there are, Brazil is the, the sixth largest economy in the world, and the potential for gains from deepening a relationship between the United States and Brazil are enormous, and yet it, it hasn't risen to the top level. So the risk-reward uh, calculus in terms of taking on a domestic political issue like Cuba, or an issue that has been sort of mythologized into a domestic political issue, um, has really tilted in the direction of risk. Uh, but the foreign policy agenda of this president, as you all know, has been Iraq, Iran, Syria, Arab Spring, Afghanistan, not Latin America. Um, let me, um, however, excuse me, just um, cover a little bit um, in a more granular level what has happened between the United States and Cuba. Just to run through it. We had the announcement in April 2009 that we would, uh, that Cuban Americans could travel and send remittances. Now on that piece alone, what I think that has created 
is a dynamic in which Miami, to use that metaphorically, Miami is now far ahead of Washington in terms of what um, the Cuban American community supports and will support in terms of broader policy. That's sort of to point to the major mythology of domestic politics. We've said for a long time domestic politics are the problem, but the data really belies that. Here's the data. Barack Obama was elected in 2008, but he did not win the state of Florida because of the Cuban American vote. He lost the Cuban American vote by about 64%, and the only Cuban Americans that voted for him were in the young 18 to 35 year old cohort. We're going to see a rerun of that again in 2012 when um, uh, his, he will, like, if he wins Florida, it will, and the Hispanic vote is important, it will be the non Cuban Hispanic vote that gets him to the 29 electoral votes. Um, so he has much more space in terms of voting, in terms of voting patterns than uh, his political people inside of the White House will acknowledge. Number two, uh, campaign finance, which I think is a little bit more important almost than the votes. We now have ha we now have Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who's the chairman of the, the chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee, and Debbie, of course, was was the chair of Red to Blue. She's very progressive on domestic issues, foreign policy issues, but on this issue, she has been in lockstep with the Cuban Five, with the other Cuban Five, and um, she has also been able to channel funds through um, from Cuban American uh, sort of old money, old politics anti-change Cuban American money to uh, members of Congress on the blue side and to people running for Congress, people are trying to hold on, on to seats. And she has the capacity to make a lot of noise now that she's in the chairwoman's position of the DNC and has access to money. Let me talk a little bit about Alan Gross and the, um, because it is true that, that Gross's uh, imprisonment has become the obstacle toward to moving forward. But you know, there's always, I don't want to sound at all derisive, there's always an Alan Gross problem in the bilateral relationship. We, have, we can point to decade after decade some major obstacle that one or the other government can point to as the reason why we're not going forward. And this time it's Alan Gross. What, why, why, did, why did the Cuban government arrest Alan Gross? Well, my, my speculation about that is that Trinidad, Tobago, Barack Obama's election created very high expectations. And the expectations is that was that if the President of the United States he's, says he's ready to, that the policy has failed and he's ready to change it, that he's not going to simply allow to stay in place the Bush regime, uh, regime change programs that he inherited. But in fact, what happened is that the USAID programs for which Alan Gross was a subcontractor of one of the biggest beltway <coughs> bandits that receives multi-million dollar contracts for part of the subcontracting of American foreign policy, Gross himself had been part of that under Bush and it continued under Obama, essentially with no accountability, with no real knowledge of what these programs were. And after watching him for five or six years commute in and out of Havana, use members of the Jewish community in the United States and down there to test drive this um, uh, began satellite uh, wide spectrum SIM card that he was using. The Cuban government took this as a, 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 an intrusion on, uh, obviously a violation of its laws, but also a very clear sign that the programs put in place under Bush, there was no intention of them changing. So his arrest in a way is, is thought of as, or becomes a way to forced the Obama administration to shine a light on these programs that it inherited. Um, the fact that he is still in jail is incredibly sad and also um, there have been numerous missed opportunities in which he could have been released. But what has been also true is that a, the programs have barely been reformed by the Obama administration. They are still in place. And B, there's been, and importantly, no real diplomacy but by the United States to actually get him out. No real diplomacy. Yes, Bill Richardson has gone down there with lots of publicity around him, and we've seen Chris Dodd and Senator Levin and Congresswoman 
uh, Lee, and you know, there hasn't been by the, the White House or the State Department serious diplomacy to get him out. The two governments at the beginning of the administration flirted a little bit after the Haiti earthquake with cooperation on public health grounds, for example, dealing with um, the major uh, catastrophe there. Of course, you all know that Cuba has 10, 15 years of having a major public health network on the ground, and the United States was um, po well positively inclined initially to try to support Cuba's health network, but at the same time, and, and provision of health services to Haitians, but at the same time that we were talking to Cuba about how to actually construct something together, we continued back to those programs that, that Obama inherited to try to induce Cuban doctors to uh, working around the world to defect. So the kind of cross purposes of, uh, or, or sim just bloody contradictions of our policy um, were sort of ultimately unresolvable and I think politically not digestible within the context of Havana where you have a, a new president whose agenda is domestic by and large and who has made a clear decision, not just this president, Raul, but others, that after 50 years they can, there's, there's really no rush to, um, to cut deals with Washington in which Washington actually isn't putting anything really tangible on the table as far as change. So I'm going to stop there, and because um, I, I think you might have questions, and I would be happy to answer any of them. So thank you very much. Does anyone so, have a question card? Yes, so my apologies, I realize I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Lisa Garcia Bagoya, the chair of the Center for Latino Policy Research here at Berkeley. And um, my understanding is that you're going to put questions on cards if you want us, Julia. And while we're collecting those, I did want to take a moment to talk a little bit about, I, I should uh, acknowledge I'm Cuban American, but from Los Angeles, which is a, a different animal. <laughs> and. Uh, and, and, you know, for me, growing up, Cuba was always sort of frozen in amber, right? It was stories from my parents that were this sort of lost golden period. Um, and it struck me this week as, as I was listening to the drama of trying to bring um, these Cubans here and to say we started planning this conference a year and a half ago, and it was really important to us from the beginning to have the Cuban perspective be present, right? Because part of the issue with this is that in the United States, we, we talk about Cuba sometimes often without Cubans in the room. And, the embargo is what makes this happen. And I think, first of all, it's important to point out that what the Obama administration did in terms of liberalization is simply take us back to where we were before George W. Bush. So it isn't really a liberalization. It's, it's, it's sort of moving draconian policies back to semi-draconian. But the second is, and I have to give recognition to Mark Levin and, and Christine Trost and uh, Marisol, Lo Marisol Lopez, who I'm not sure is here, who had to deal with the drama of the ping pong ball that was yesterday of, he has a visa. He doesn't have a visa. He might have a visa. Buy the ticket. Cancel the ticket. Buy the ticket. Oh my goodness, we have to get them on a plane. And I mean, the, the insanity of what it is to try to get Cubans to be able to actually talk about Cuba you know, in person in the United States. And, and that because of that, we see Cuba, I think, in this country as frozen in amber. And, and we see it as unchanging. And so I appreciate in your remarks of thinking about, to talk about what's changing in Cuba is really different from how we generally characterize what's happening there. And I think because of that lack of exchange, I'm sure if anyone ever approaches Christine and says they, they want to do a conference on Cuba again, she's going to run screaming from the room because she doesn't want to do this again. And so what happens is the only people involved in this are the ideologues on either side. And it, and it, and it makes for, it, it, sorry, not only, but many, <laughs> many. What ends up happening is often it gets deferred to yes, the extremes. Totally. And, and so you can't actually have dialogue. And I think Without that, it's almost impossible to move this forward. And, and, and only having had this experience, I think, can you realize how completely irrational our current system is and the fact that we can't actually have a conversation with people from both countries in the room. And my last example about that irrationality is if anyone paid attention to the coverage of Hurricane Isaac and you think about geography, if a hurricane is hitting Florida and the Dominican Republic and Haiti, there's a really big island right by there. <laughs> that is also being affected by the hurricane, and there was no coverage. It, it's as if Cuba doesn't exist in, in, in the United States. And, and that amnesia, and that it's almost like we disowned a, a recalcitrant child or something and, and refused to acknowledge that they still exist on the planet. But so long as we have this very strange 
almost that the, you now have this hole in the Caribbean that you know we don't talk about what what's there. That it's very difficult to have a, po a policy that actually really addresses the the, the deep and um, important relationship that exists between be, between both countries. So I hope that today is is the beginning of that. But I think people who haven't experienced this need to know just how difficult it is to have a conference with <laughs> two Cubans <laughs> who come. And, and I'm, I'm thrilled that Carlos Azuara will be here later. Um, but I think, I think it's, it's part of what makes it difficult to move the relationship forward, um, especially on the, I think, this is on the US side, just to make clear, this is the State Department. Um, and we, I think we should acknowledge, we, we talked a lot when we were scheduling this conference about whether or not this was a football weekend. We didn't talk enough about the fact that it was going to be 40 days before a presidential election and we were inviting two Cubans to come to Berkeley, which one could imagine perhaps had something to do. But, you know, the, the, the Cubans that got invited to the Latin American Studies Association conference last fall also got rejected, both two of whom were Rafael and Carlos. So one of whom was was uh, Mariela Castro, nevertheless, Raul's daughter. Right. So can you square that circle? I cannot. I can't and that's, and that there is no, the, so, so the lack of, of any logic um, is a problem. And so I think, I think we all need to be, those of us who aren't as closely related to the issue need to be, become more aware in order to hopefully move us to a more logical place in terms of our US-Cuban relations. Um, so the first questions, I don't know, maybe this is the Cuban me. I'm going to start with the most dramatic of the questions. Um, what is your worst fear for what will happen in Cuba in the next 10 years? And I have to say for me, again, as someone who has family on the island, I, what, is, what is the worst fear, what is your worst fear for what will happen in, to Cuba in the next 10 years? And, and I think for me at least this is, what are, what are the chances of a peaceful transition to normalized relations? And to, and to, you know, all the economic shifts that you talked about. Well, I mean, I think we've already had one peaceful transition in the last, over the course of the last decade. And, you know, much to the chagrin of some in Washington who were salivating at the moment that Fidel became sick. In fact, I think we have Ileana Rusletinen on camera calling for the legitimacy of, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if she used the word assassination, but certainly, you know, that, that political violence remains a legitimate tool when co coming to the issue of accelerating a transition in Cuba. Um, but truthfully, I don't see, you know, this model of a violent political transition at all in the cards in Cuba over the next decade. Um, I think what I do worry about is that time is ticking away and that, you know, there's a kind of perfectionism that is, uh, that, that I perceive in the slow, you know, we could talk about the fast pace of change, but things are also kind of moving slowly and doing things by consensus and, you know, having certain experiments with more economic freedom, uh, successful e experiments with an economic freedom bring, you know, provide momentum to building political consensus within the party for more freedoms. You know, that process is going very slowly and Raul Castro is in his 80s. And there's a generational issue which I think is very, which you know we must face. If you look at the so so my biggest fear is that the sh the reconstruction of this social contract, which I'm not really sure what it's going to look like. It'll be some very Cuban hybrid. Um, that that process won't have gelled enough by the time the founding generation really does leave the stage, and that there won't be the I mean. If you look at who's in the Central Committee now and who's governing provinces and who are running ministers, you do see people in their 40s and 50s and 60s that clearly are the next generation. But does the skill set exist? Does the, you know, what happens when the founding generation is gone? You know, what kind of coherence 
really does exist, and that goes to sort of, you know, the um, the role of the military in Cuba. That goes to the role of the of foreign investment. Um, are we going to see institutions that are solid enough remain post Raul that don't lend themselves to the kinds of um, criminal networks that are so present in Mexico, in Central America. I mean, right now, Cuba is kind of a, an island of relatively free of corruption, peaceful, stable, and not violent. And I think keeping the institutions together to keep that in place once the founding generation is gone, I mean, that, that I couldn't possibly guess. I could hope, but I can't guess at what that's going to look like. So we have a lot of questions about gross in the Cuban Five. Okay. Um, so I think maybe if you want to explain the, uh, the, the, the non-congressional <laughs> Cuban Five, who, who that is for, for those folks in the audience who, who don't know. And then just to talk about, we have sort of a number of questions to talk about how closely is the gross issue connected to that of the Cuban Five, and the secondary is sort of what are the possibilities of, of resolution? OK. Well, number one. And um, there are people who will get the facts better than I will on this. The, the other Cuban five, the Cuban five, four of whom are still in jail and one of whom is serving out parole in Florida, were uh, members of Cuba's intelligence services who were sent to the United States to South Florida in the 1990s to penetrate the exile organizations who at the time were carrying out uh, terrorist attacks from uh, the United States and Central America directed at Cuba's tourism industry. And the Cuban Five were um, highly trained agents who, agents, I, I'm going to use the wrong word, people who were uh, penetrated these organizations here to develop intelligence related to Cuba's own counterterrorism policies. Um, using some, inf with some information that they had gathered about uh, this is when Brothers to the Rescue was flying over and that they had gathered when, still when those organizations were much more uh, active than they are now, uh, the Cuban government decided to provide information to the FBI and to the White House uh, that these individuals had gathered. And rather than um, go after the organizations that they had penetrated, uh, the FBI in Florida instead decided to arrest them. And their trials were horribly... Um, carried out in, in a political environment, politicized environment, and the long and the short of it is that um, one of them is um, serving out, is it three years of parole? Two years of parole, three years of parole in Florida. Four of them remain in jail. Some of them are serving multiple life sentences. Um, so that's just a story on who, who they are. And just remember, you know, um, the Russian spy swap between the United States and Russia that happened a couple of years ago. The uh, Israelis, you know, gave up 1,000 people with serious, serious violent records for one guy. And um, the United States is um, sitting on uh, any movement around the Cuban Five. Now, the second part of your question is are how is it related to gross? Right. Or are they connected? What was the third question? I just want to make sure I... No, that was it. Oh, resolution. well, resolution. resolution. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, is it is it connected, and, and what are, what is the likelihood that? <laughs> thank you. Well, so thank you. This is, when Gross was first arrested. You know, it's possible that the political calculus inside of Havana was, okay, this is great. We're going to use this guy to get the Cuban Five out and and play out the string as long as it takes. But I don't actually think that initially the, the what is now a very direct and very public linkage between the Cuban Five and Gross, I don't think that that was top of mind initially when he was first arrested. Um, but it became so the longer this, uh, the longer the diplomacy fell flat, the longer the United States failed to reform those programs. So it was a period in, you know, remember, because you said they went back to the status quo ante. I mean, it didn't even really get there because the people-to-people -people programs that Hillary Clinton promised, making reference to her husband's administration, those actually have never seen the light of day. We have a much more restricted version of those people-to-people -people programs that was announced 
a full year after Gross had been in jail. So Gross initially in that first year didn't stop the process of talks over Haiti cooperation, of um, the, in, the interagency process of figuring out how to expand people to people a little bit. It didn't stop some of the other you know, small scale, um, not small scale, important symbolic steps that happened, for example, um, no, I'm sorry, the Juanes concert was before he was arrested. Anyway, we had a kind of cultural and educational um, opening even as Gross was in jail. But as um, the United States would sort of repeatedly go to Havana and directly or through its interlocutors say, um, just release him unilaterally and then we'll, con we'll begin to consider a smorgasbord of issues that we know you want us to address. That was kind of the, the approach. Release him unilaterally and we'll think about taking you off the terror list. Release him terrorist list, the State Department terror list, terrorist list. We'll do all of these things if you first do this unilaterally. And oh, by the way, we might consider some of spouses getting to visit and maybe we'll let one of them serve out his parole at home. You know, the United States kind of opened the door to a Cuban Five discussion and um, Havana definitely walked through that door and walked through that door in a way that I think is entirely logical. So entirely logical that, um, you know, if you're going to put the Cuban Five on the table, man, well, we are too. So by, by you know, sort of three and a half years into the uh, Obama administration when no real framework, diplomatic framework for going forward was ever put on the table. When the United States says, Wayne, I forgot to acknowledge Wayne who was my professor once I was doing my PhD. Um, none of the initiatives that could have moved forward were put on the table. What happened was the Cuban Five and the Alan Gross issues became sort of the only show in town. N and the, the last point on this, and this, is, this goes to the other Cuban Five, is after the sort of, let's call them people to people light programs were put back on the table in 2010, or you know, re, the regulations were reissued, and Gross remained in jail. The public word on the street in Washington was, well, we want to do a lot more. But until, Gro until they release Gross, we just can't do it politically. And that sent the message to the Cuban Five on the Hill that the last thing they should do is create the conditions for Alan Gross to be released. The last thing they should do is allow those regime change reform uh, programs to be reformed. Because with Alan Gross's release, by God, it looked like the Obama administration was actually willing to do a lot more on the bilateral front. So the, the, the status quo, those who sort of want the status quo to keep in place also came to have a stake in keeping Alan Gross in jail. And please don't misconstrue my comments. I very much hope and have every time I talk to Cuban officials, encourage them to release the man because I don't think that, that there's anything to gain by keeping him in jail. Um, and I suspect there are some on the island who also have a, a stake in the status quo, too. I mean, that's just basic politics. So someone asked, uh, what are the, some of the problems that Cuba may face? Uh, Congresswoman Lee talked about lifting the embargo if the United States were to lift it tomorrow. What, what are some of the problems that might arise if you suddenly did have open relations between the US and Cuba? Problems. Those are problems well, I would like to have. Well, just saying, would, would it negatively or positively affect the future economy? Would it be oh, stabilizing for Cuba? for Cuba? Would it be? Well, I mean, w Cubans tell us all the time, you know, bring it on. I, we, we, you <laughs> know, can we, it. we can handle it. Um, I, I think the, you know, the upside has to do, I, I alluded to the political culture in Cuba and that political culture has been very much negatively affected by the relentless beat of the embargo because it, this embargo and the U.S. policy is used as an excuse to suppress um, open political debate, of course. So I think it could only be positive on that front. On the economic side, look, you know, this is the logical, natural market for Cuba. 
here. And there are, you know, trade, commerce, investment. Um, we heard about HIV AIDS, scientific exchange. Cuba has a biotech industry that is producing drugs that can't be used by Americans and vice versa because Cuba's, because the embargo has third country extraterritorial implications. So the, I mean, would, would it, I think what the, the, if the current government is in place whenever it is that the embargo is lifted, I wouldn't expect just because we lift the embargo for suddenly Havana to just say, okay, come on down, anyone that wants to. I mean, probably in terms of tourists, absolutely yes. But I wouldn't assume that a green light on our side would mean that this Cuban government would suddenly you know, do backflips to bring in American capital in one fell swoop. This Cuban government isn't doing backflips to bring in capital from any country. Everything is happening very slowly, and I think there's probably a slice of the Cuban market, trade and investment, that will be open to the United States, but, but it won't be as dramatic as some might hope. So our last question is from someone with absolutely beautiful handwriting who managed to get a whole heck of a lot on a card. So it's long. So it's a um, comment and a question. It's a, well, it's, you know, it's an academic question with four parts. So <laughs> as they tend to be. Who are you? Uh, yeah, beautiful handwriting, but a good question. So what are your thoughts regarding, so we're, you're going to have to go through, sit through the whole thing. It's long. I'm just going to read it. What are your thoughts regarding how Raul Castro's new economic reforms could influence social inequalities? and further widen income gaps given those who have the ability to create and or sustain a business venture are those who already have a certain level of capital or economic stability and those who don't already have these economic means have more challenges and limited opportunities to enter into a business venture. So the answers to the questions are embedded in the question. <laughs> so I guess Which I go just read this academic question. back to you. <laughs> Yes. Or do you agree with the answer no, to the I mean, question? I, mean, that are I think there's the already a lot of data and evidence showing that 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 one price of uh, this change process that's unfolding is greater inequality, and that access to capital. I mean, we call it remittances, but Cuban Americans are investing in their own families and in the sort of mm -hmm. small level of small businesses that are emerging there. So uh, we all know that not everybody in Cuba has Cuban American family members that have the capital to capital to invest. Um, we haven't talked enough, but I think we'll get to it in the panels today about just what that does look like, and not only in terms of small-scale remittances, but what's happening with Cuban-American investors who are finding third-country back roads um, to get into Cuba at a much larger scale. What kind of political deals are being cut? Uh, yes, indeed. The, um, it's like here, you know, it's, it's easy to start a business. <laughs> well, Romney says just get money from your parents. Um, <laughs> but no, that's going it's to easier to start a business if you already have a little nest egg to start a business. And obviously that's the case in Cuba too. And, and, the, and I think one of the sources of um, dragging, you know, slowing down this process actually is that Cubans it's hard to generalize, but that there is a resistance because there's such a commitment to the social justice components of the, the 50 years of that revolution. There is a very strong worry that sustaining that cohesion of the last 50 years will be um, very tough as inequality grows. And so I'm going to use chair's discretion and ask one last question for myself and ask you to do what we should never do, which is prognosticate. But what are the chances that you think that if we have a second Obama administration and he is somewhat freed from the electoral considerations um, that have been referenced, although I don't completely agree that Florida is. Anyway, um, what are the chances that we'll see some real movement? Or do you think that, Latin, I guess, so the first level is will Latin America sort of increase in prominence? And secondly, if so, will there be actual change on Cuba policy, you think? So um, all of us have gone through the moment when a first term makes a move to a second term, and we were hopeful from Clinton's first term to Clinton's second term. You know, we've lived this, right? I, I, I am a glass half full person. And um, I will say, back to the, the two summits that bracketed this first term, that Cartagena summit was 
finally the kick in the you know what that did uh, give real pause to some in the administration. I don't know if President Obama really internalized what the message was, but I do know that Secretary Clinton did. And there's no major positive foreign policy legacy for the first term when it comes to Latin America. And in a second term, I know, I'm confident that the case will be made internally that there is a huge opportunity to be the president who finally overcomes this narrow political uh, stasis and makes the right decisions with respect to Cuba. Will that appeal to him, or will he look to nuclear disarmament as his big foreign policy legacy? I mean, there are other options to choose from if you're planning your second term, but I do think that 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 will come up. It will be put on the table by conferences like this, by a number of different NGOs and academics and um, public scholars. But we'll just have to see. We'll just have to see. Um, I do think that uh, a wonderful way to kickstart that process would be to find an arrangement to take the gross and Cuban five issue finally off our plate and, and solve it once and for all. But in your own words, then, will something else be Was, Wasn't that my own words? Well, no, you, you had said, you had said oh. that if you look historically, there's always been that thing. Oh, 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 there's right. always been a thing, right? So let's say that's we take thing. them off yeah. the table. Will some other thing, will Manos and Rescate do something that creates another thing? Yeah, but I, that's what an excellent, we? you know, you raise something really important, which is there, there will be opponents to this, yes. to any thaw. So there will be a thing. So part of the planning needs to be, all right, there's going to be a thing. How do we anticipate, neutralize, and mitigate it from the front end? And that requires having you know, the actual strategic planning and attention, not just of the minions, but of the president himself. And I just have no idea whether he'll be ready for that. But I, I do think that there will be another thing. Right. Because, you know, drama is really what this relationship has always been about. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Sort of what it is. Uh, so with that, I, I want you to please join me in thanking Julia for such a wonderful set of insights. Thank you to all of you for such thoughtful questions, and my apologies to those of you um, for whom we were not able to get to the ones that you provided. We're going